Good to be back in the house of the Lord this morning. Thankful for the grace of God that's brought us this far. Why don't we stand this morning? In this first Sunday of 2021, why don't we praise the name of the Lord Jesus? Uh, certainly you're all right. Uh, give it your best. Give it your all. Let Jesus know uh, that you love him today. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness uh, and your grace today. Jesus, we praise you. Jesus, we worship you. Jesus, we open up our hearts. Uh, we awaken our spirits today, Lord God. Move and bless and touch every life in a special way. God, we praise you and give you the glory. Thank you this morning. Uh, lift your voice. Uh, lift your voice and thank him today. Uh, and just let God know you love him. God is good. God is good. And he is love. Uh, let's give the Lord a great big praise offering today. And just thank you. Thank you, Lord God, for the precious blood of Christ. Amen. Get a hymnal as the brother comes. Praise the Lord. Page 249, just over in the glory land. How many ready to go home? 249. I have a home prepared where the saints are Just over in the glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side.
service for Jesus, your King. And I'm thankful for the privilege to serve God. We want our ushers to come at this, mor- this time this morning. You can have a privilege to serve God, too. Amen. Let's give in the offering and pay our tithe. And it's uh, just a, a, a blessing to be here. We enjoyed our time in Colorado, and it was great. To, but I'm also thankful to be home, to be back with all of you, to be back to do the work of God that he's called us to do. Amen. Brother, if you'll pray for the gift and the giver. So we thank you for the opportunity to give an offering back to bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
giving today. This time the choir is going to sing and just let God fall down fresh upon you and let the Lord bless you today.
Hallelujah. Praise God. You may be seated. If I can get my sermon to orient the right direction, we'll be off and running. I'm glad to have Pastor Sister Kinson back with us and join us in our shower. You know what they say about Washington, right? September showers coupled with October, November, December, January, February, March showers brings April flowers. Showers. <laughs> We're also glad to have Sister Denton with us. Where are you, Sabrina? She's here. She's been with us for a few days. Her brother's really in need of a touch. He's been in bad condition. So she's up here to see after him. And you left Glenn at home, right? So this is kind of a vacation, right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So the bad part is she didn't bring any sunshine from Florida. She's pastor's wife in Florida. But the good part is she didn't bring Glenn. <laughs> now, Glenn, if you're out there, buddy, we love you. We love you. That's the bad part about live streaming, you know. <laughs> We're also glad to have brother and sister Kraus. Brother, you stand there. Let them see you. Is Flora here with us? Where is she at? There she is. Praise God. As you know, they've been pastoring in Houston for a while until Reverend Teeman took the church, and they've been on their way here in a roundabout way. But they just got here, was it Friday? Welcome to the Graham team. Amen. We're glad to have you, and I'm glad to have me too. I want to read to you a verse of Scripture. And it comes out of, let me see here, John chapter 12, verses 27 through 33. But before we start, let's have our new pastor in Graham, Brother Kinson, from Denver, <laughs> to pray for the message. God bless you, brother. Jesus, most of all, we're glad you're here too. Amen. Father, we ask you to bless your presence. Amen. We really are glad to have you back. Amen. He said, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spoke to him. But Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world, and now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if I, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying which death he should die, what death he should die. And I'm preaching to you from that today on the title, The War of the Worlds. There have always been conflicts and struggles to gain the power of kingdoms. Throughout history, there's been instances without number where a king was deposed or a king was exiled and he spent the rest of his life trying to regain his kingdom and his power. And the narrative, this narrative has been used over and over and over in books and stories for many centuries. It's because underlying all these stories... There's the grandest story of all. 
a conflict that since the beginning of time and continuing unto this day is on such a grand scale. This is the conflict between Satan and God. God and Satan have history today. You ever said that? Maybe about your ex-girlfriend. Oh, we have history. Same thing. God and Satan have history. And Satan is not God's girlfriend. In fact, he's not his friend at all. But he was at one time. And Satan is a word that comes from satanas, which means adversary. That's all it means. Enemy. But in the case of Satan himself, who is given this word as a name and title, it is that he is the inveterate adversary of God, which means from the inveteratus in the Latin, which is uh, old, means he's old. Satan is really old. Don't call any of us old. Satan is the one that's old. But God's older than him. And it means that when you say an enemy is an inveterate enemy, it means that he has a particular habit, an activity, or an interest that is long established and unlikely to change. And that is the way Satan is. His hatred of God is, goes back, and it's very old. It goes all the way back to the very beginning, and it's unlikely to change today. Satan is not going to change. And Satan is no warrior. I want you to look at something for a little while. Satan is no warrior that he should get glory. He should not be given a badge of honor. He should not be set on a pedestal as some great one. Look at what he has done. What has he ever done to gain any power that he's ever had? He has Satan's derangement syndrome. SDS. He staged an overthrow, deceived a woman, and speak lies to people. That's all he's ever done. He's not a mighty warrior with a sword and armor that has gone forth conquering and to conquer. He is not some great skilled one. There is one skill that he has. He's a deceiver, and that he's good at. Some people have Satan's uh derangement syndrome but that's a different story isn't it he staged an overthrow look at one but this is but one verse to show that satan's desire was to be king just like the old narratives in uh folklore he wanted to be the king but you have to understand where he was god had created him and he is a cherub, he is not, he's an angelic creature. He is not like a man or even any of the other angels. He's different in his appearance. And God created him, and he was literally the head of all the nations of the earth before it was destroyed and before it was recreated and Adam was made. What? What? You know, all you scientists have been looking for a, a justification for the, what did they call it when they had the flood? The, um, the ice age, yeah. It's like the sister said the other day. She was putting that stuff, to, uh, putting that stuff on the ground to keep the ice from freezing. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> it was just a slip of the tongue, but it was cute anyway. Hey! Ice is already frozen. For those of you that just joined us this morning. All right. He was the leader of this world, and he was an angelic creature. And in Isaiah 14, 12 through 17, we gain an insight of what happened to him. And this is why Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Isaiah wrote, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Which name meant, means light bearer. 
son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. That's where God sits. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High, capital H. I will be like God. He said, Yet shalt thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners, he staged an overthrow, but he failed. Why? All because he wanted to be king of kings and lord of lords. But he forgot that God created him he did not create God. He forgot that God gave him life, not vice versa. And he thought in his pride, because he was so beautiful, Lucifer meant light bearer, and he was covered with light. The Bible shows us in another passage, I think it's Ezekiel, that he was covered with precious stones, and he glistened and gleamed and had glory upon him. But Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall from heaven like lightning. When he made this attempt to overthrow God that created him, God chucked him down out of heaven and took away the power that God had given him. And he became a fallen, bitter, hateful spirit that would do anything he could to exact vengeance upon the God that thrust him out of office. So it's no wonder that he appeared to Eve in the garden after God had said, let there be light. He didn't create the sun that day. He just allowed it to shine once more. And he created a firmament in the heavens, Genesis said, as the ice all began to melt. It said in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and he did. But then verse 2 said that the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the water. And God said, let there be light, and it opened up into the expanse of all the heavens that the scientists haven't even fully discovered yet. And the sun was alive and began to warm everything. And God set it all in order again. And he put man in the beautiful garden that he had created and gave him woman to be a helper and a companion, not a thump dummy. What's a thump dummy? I don't know. I just made that up. <laughs> the object of his abuse. Someone for him to strike and abuse and mistreat. That's not what God gave man a wife for. But it said in 1 Timothy 2, 13 and 14, look at this. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. She is the one that brought sin into the world. She was the first one that sinned. And thus she was cursed with a curse that was above that of Adam. But wait a minute. All you ladies out there will be saying, well, I can hear you now in your heart. There's a little voice going, well. Shame on you. I haven't even gotten down to it yet. <laughs> it's funny, I have it here, and I typed this myself, said, and like most people, Adam thought, well, so there he is too. Well. That's an immediate announcement of, I disagree. Well. Or some sit around the fellowship table, well. 
Well, I think nobody wants to know what you think or what I think because it really doesn't make much difference. But if you don't believe that what God thinks makes a difference, then you're sadly mistaken. Eve was the one that was deceived. Satan came to her, spoke to her through that serpent, and said a few choice words. But Adam, maybe you're saying, well, the woman. Okay. He wasn't throwing off on women. It's really more of an edict against the man. He was not deceived. At least she thought that it was okay or something. She thought something. She was deceived. She was misled by wrong thinking. But he knew full well what he was doing. So he thought, well, she already blew it. So might as well, let me try that. Hand me that fruit. She already sinned anyway. It's too late. That's the way Satan talks to people. You're already not right with God. You might as well go ahead and do what you want to do because you got to get forgiveness anyway. You might as well make it good. You might as well build up a lot of stuff to get forgiven for and be a Catholic. <laughs> build up all your sins and then go eat your righteousness cookie and dismiss it from your conscience. By the way, we're having communion tonight in the house of the Lord. And it's not a righteousness cookie. It's the body of Christ, not literally, but it represents I am a partaker of his blood and his body. And Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. So we're going to remember the Lord and his goodness to us tonight by taking holy communion. He speaks lies to people. The Antichrist, which will be his puppet in the tribulation that is to come. It is said in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9, that even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. And it describes the, what the works of Satan are. He said, with all power and signs and lying wonders. To a man called Ananias, Peter said in Acts 5, 3, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? It was a situation where nothing was expected of him, but he felt like he had to lie. And Peter said, Satan filled your heart to lie. God doesn't like liars. He loves their soul, but he hates lies. What's a lie? Deception, misleading, covering up truth. Lots of ways to tell a lie. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, according to the scripture. Today, God doesn't want us to be like this deceiver. And if we are not saved, God doesn't want you to be like the king of all the unsaved, Satan. He does not want us to be deceived. God doesn't want us to be like Satan. Look at what he said in Ephesians 4, through 25. He said that you put off, this is one of those parts of the Bible that uh, only a handful of preachers talk about anymore. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. Stop behaving like you did before you got saved which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. So what is it there you see that leads a man astray? His lust within him deceives him and makes him think like Eve thought. There's a, this is not a really big deal. And she said to the serpent, well, God said that uh, you should not touch the fruit, and in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. But uh, probably she had that mixed up. Because God didn't say to touch it. He didn't say not to touch it. He said, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And even if he had, it didn't matter. She was confused. She was confused. And she convinced herself, through the help of Satan, 
that God was keeping something good from her. Is that not a prevailing attitude today? Oh, to be a Christian, God keeps good things from you. There's so many great things in life and pleasures to enjoy, and God doesn't want me to have them. What kind of God is he? What kind of God is that that will do this? What kind of God is he that he would do that? I don't want anything to do with him. What you ought to be saying is, what kind of God is he? Let me get things straight with him. That's what they should be saying, but instead they say, what kind of God does he think he is? He took my grandma. Your grandma was gone anyway. Well, she was still alive. She was 98. Give her a couple more, and she'll be gone like all flesh. You speaking against my grandma? No, I love your grandma. I don't even know your grandma, but I love her. Whatever. God bless grandma. But grandma, like you and I, are, is going to die. I is going to die. And that's kind of what he's saying here. Put that old man down. This is not euthanasia. This is about the old you before he was saved. Put that old man back in the grave where he belongs. Don't let the old behavior rise up and be something you do again. You, Christ took it out. Leave it out. Put aside, he said, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which, after God, is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, that means since you're a Christian now, and you've been born again, recreated in righteousness and true holiness, he said, put away lying, and speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. He continued and said, be ye angry and sin not. You get mad, bring it under control. Don't um, unleash your wrath on people. He said, neither give place to the devil. So Satan is there, the enemy of God, the old enemy of God, constantly working in people to bring about these things that are un displeasing to God. And so that they might be under his displeasure and thus under his penalty of, for sin, which is death. Not only death of the body, but the second death, which is the lake of fire. Not hell, the lake of fire. Hell will be cast into the lake of fire, according to Revelation. So the final end is worse than hell itself. Though there have been people there for thousands of years who will be brought up and stand before God and the books will be open, the sentence will be declared, and they will be condemned because they believe not. They had a chance and they didn't want it. They could have been saved, but they didn't have time. The pleasures of this life meant more to them than having God's eternal life. The deliverance from the inevitable death that is passed upon all men. For that all have sinned and all have come short of the glory of God. That's what he said. Because Adam and Eve didn't generate saints. They generated more fallen people who generated more fallen people and now we have an earth populated with fallen people which is why you see violence and chaos and hate and division and sin and criminal behavior everywhere every nation all around the world even the penguins stole those suits from the tuxedo store Now verse 28 said, let him that stole steal no more. Those penguins are going to hell. Now God gave them those suits. They came out of the egg dressed for church. Oh wait, they're live born. Are they? No, they lay, they lay eggs. They kick the eggs around on the ice and then they sit on them and do all those things. It's an egg. What came first, the penguin or the egg? The ice. So, but let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. 
Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. All of this was instructed to us based upon what he said in verse... 22, put off the old man and his behavior. So he itemized the kind of behavior that we had before we got saved. Satan has two methods today. One is keeping people from hearing the word. Two is confusing the word. These are the main two methods that he uses. It's all about lies, and you could use a lot of different categorical classifications, but that's what it boils down to. He wants to keep the word from people, and if he can't keep it, he wants to blur the lines and confuse people. And he hates anybody that makes a clear definition of those lines. And this is where you get false doctrines, false spokesmen for God, suppression of churches and preaching. You got women online that look like Jezebel incarnate, being self-appointed prophets and having visions of the end of the world. Don't listen to those phonies. Do yourself a favor. Good heavens. You look at them and think, what? You know, you're here preaching, trying to give people the truth, and you have these clowns online blurring the line. This is not unlike how the new media operate. The news media, I mean. News media. If there's something against their agenda, they simply publish lies like it's news. Or they ignore the story. They don't want the truth to get out. We don't want anybody to hear what happened. We don't want anyone to know what's going on. Amen. So now, let's look at the parable of the sower for a minute. Luke 8, I don't know what's going on. Take care of it, whatever it is. Everybody okay? What's happening? Who did? They still passed out? Pray for them. Who is it? What was going on here? Who's that? Brother Engwell? Well, let's pray for Brother Engwell right now. God, in Jesus' name, touch Brother Engwell, Lord. You know what's going on with him. You know his need. Lay your hand upon him and help him today. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name, your strength for him. Amen. Bless him. All right. God help him. All right, are you ready for the parable of the sower? Okay, he'll be okay. They'll help him there. The parable is this. This is what Jesus said to them. The seed is the word of God. He had several things that he mentioned here about seed. Some fell by the wayside. Some fell on good ground. Some fell among thorns. Okay, I'll just wait on you. Is he all right? You better take him and find out what's happening with him. Brother Engwell's a good man. He's been in the church a long time. There, he's awake. Go ahead, help him back.
Okay, let's continue. We're at the parable of the sower, Luke chapter 8, 11 through 15. Jesus spoke of the three places that the seed fell, and we don't want to explore the whole parable right now, but I want to just bring out something from it because he talked about the seed falling in different places and therefore growing differently based upon where it fell. And he said in this one instance, verse 12, that the seed that fell by the wayside was representative of people who hear. When the word of God falls upon the ears of people who hear it, meaning they actually receive it, believe it, accept it, said then comes the devil and takes away the word out of their heart least they should believe and be saved. He said, they on the rock are those who hear the word, have no root, they believe for a while, and in temptation fall away. And then there's the thorns that's choked by the world. So he said, the devil cometh and taketh the word out of their heart. Now this isn't possible. But you see that it's a preventive measure here. Notice the language that's used. He said, he takes the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So this is people who have heard, but they're not saved. So once they hear the word of God, some of you may be here visiting. You've never heard the word of God before. I don't know. That, that still happens in America for some reason. I know because the devil tries to make sure you don't hear it. Because he doesn't want to uh, allow you to get saved. He doesn't want you to... Find Christ. So he does everything he can, and he uses people. He uses circumstances. He uses lies to get you to move away from the Word of God once you've heard it. He will question the source. He will say the preacher's a dog, or the churches are hypocrites, or this has happened, and that's happened. Or I knew a person that said they were a Christian, but they weren't real. And he'll take all these things and, and weave a tall tale for you to get you to dismiss the Word of God as being anything of any value or that can help us. And he said, but there are some that falls on good ground. The heart is good. The heart that does not allow uh, Satan to destroy what they've heard from the Word of God, especially when they read it in the Word of God. Then you know this isn't coming from a person that has it mixed up. I see it myself. I'm reading it in the Word. And Satan has even worked over many, many years, centuries, millennia, to stop the Word of God from being distributed. In the case, for example, of uh, the Dark Ages. They told them that they can't read the Scriptures because it's only for the priests. To keep the people in dark. Why do you think they call it the dark ages? It wasn't because there were knights running around in the day. It was because people were darkened with the lack of knowledge. There was ignorance everywhere. Then along came the reformer, Martin Luther, who was reading the Bible. And he said, what? Wait a minute. The Bible said we're justified by faith, not by works. And you know about him nailing that thing to the door and all the story about Martin Luther and you know about Lutheranism and everything. Basically, he was letting the world know this Catholicism and darkness and this paganistic church is wrong. Jesus wants us to be free, not dominated by priests in power. And we have, right now we have one of the most corrupt popes in history. He's a socialist communist. He's not God's man. He said, God told me to rewrite the Ten Commandments. I laughed. I said, who does this hypocrite think he is? He's not God. Only God is God, and he always will be God. 
So it's not the word of man that matters. I don't have the right to change the word of God or to make it say what I want it to say or even believe what I want to believe. God gave it to us. It's a take or break situation. You either take the word of God or just go on and suffer the loss. That is inevitable. But I'm glad that I met Jesus one day. I'm glad, I said, that I met Christ in a real relationship and got saved. And he took that old man and nailed him to the cross and said, now you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old things pass away. Behold, all things have become new. And those new things are of God now, not of the devil. So in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, he opined on it. No, God gave it to him to write. He said, but if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. In whom? This is about the lost, people that don't have Christ in their life. In whom the God of this world, little g, what do you mean, God of this world? It means when Satan deceived Adam, you'll know, uh, Eve, and then Adam followed her lead, you'll find out there that God met with them. He pronounced the necessary curses upon what they had done because of what they had done. It was their fault. And then he put them out of the garden and broke the fellowship between them. Sin separated them from the love of their God. The God that met with them every day. The God that loved them more than anything. Couldn't meet with them. Cut them off because they decided it to be so. And when that happened and he deceived them, Satan gained the power that Adam had. Adam was given dominion over all the world and everything in it. God made him the keeper, the ruler, the king of the planet. But he gave it up when he sold God out and he allowed Satan to gain the power. And that's why in the Bible he's called the prince of the power of the air. And why the Bible says that there's spiritual wickedness in high places, principalities and powers, and that they manipulate people to destroy them because Satan hates everything about you. Every one of you that's here today, every person that's alive in the earth, and everyone that's been alive. Satan hates them because we were created in the image of God and he wants to hurt the heart of God as much as he possibly can. And people going into hell by the droves. They go to hell much faster than they get saved. In numbers I'm talking about. Because the gospel's hidden to them. He said, the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. If you do not know Christ, whether you're in this church or out there somewhere, and you do not believe, Satan has blinded your mind, and you don't see what you think you see. But why listen to me? I'm not God. And here's the reason why he does this to people. At least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. War of the worlds. War of the worlds. You remember the old movie back in the 60s, maybe it was even the 50s, called War of the Worlds. And it was an apocalyptic adventure. I think H.G. Wells wrote it. Was that who it was? And it was about aliens that came to Earth and their spaceships and they had long necks that looked like this stand right here with a little head on it. And they were going pew, 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 shooting lasers at everybody and killing everybody. Then it got on the radio. So the end of the world has come. Ladies and gentlemen, and they would, you could hear that radio broadcast that freaked out bunches of people. People were, com it really happened. They were committing suicide and everything. They really thought that aliens were invading the earth and the end had come. Well, it isn't going to be aliens invading the earth. It went, uh, the Bible said we were aliens. But now we're citizens of the new Jerusalem. We're not, we're not alienated from God anymore. When you got saved, you became a citizen of God's city. That's what the Bible says. 
Amen. And when, uh, when there's an invasion of the earth, it's going to be Christ coming back, not with aliens, but with all the citizens. It's going to be a citizen's invasion. And he will take over this world. And he will bring it into subjection. And then they will beat their swords into plowshares. They're going to take their swords back to the blacksmith shop and make gardening tools with them because there won't be war anymore. Jesus will then bring peace on the earth and there will be goodwill toward man. That'll be the real Christmas right there. Amen. That's how the world's going to end. When Jesus takes his power, that is his. And I want you to know this. God has never lost his power. Even though Satan became prince of the power of the air, God never really lost his power. When we look at Job, we find out that when Satan appeared, he could only do what God let him do. That you can read it later in Job chapter 1. Only what God gave him license to do could he do. To test Job. <laughs> he knew Job would not have any of it. Job needed to see some things and realize some things, but he knew that Job would still remain faithful in spite of what happened in his life. Amen. And so uh, we looked uh, here at John chapter 12. He, Jesus said, this was our Bible reading, now my soul is troubled. What am I going to say? Jesus was right near his crucifixion. It was Im imminent. And you would think it would be thinking, this is an injustice. The, the charges aren't true. Guys, you need to get me a lawyer. I need a, where are the angels? God, help me. That is not what Jesus did. He said, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Save me from the cross. He said, no. This is the reason I came here. People think he just went down, a good man, crucified at the hands of the politically wicked. No, they're still crucifying people today in a, in a certain way. But no, he didn't want deliverance. He didn't want the Father to send legions of angels to save him from the cross. He said, for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then they heard that thunderous voice saying, I will glor I've glorified it and I will glorify it again. It shook the earth. It thundered. But some people didn't know what was going on. And Jesus said, it wasn't for me. This voice is not to reassure me before I go through the crucifixion. This voice was for you. He said, and now, and here it is, now is the time for the prince of this world to be thrown out. He had come not to be a victim of man, but he came because he's always been in power, and he was in power in this situation. Even when Pilate, the governor of Judea, said to him, don't you know I have power to crucify you or let you go? And Jesus said to him, he sat there bleeding all over, looking like someone that's about to bite the dust, which he was. He said, you don't have any power over me unless it's given you from up there. <laughs> and you see yourself sitting in front of Jay Inslee today saying, you don't have any power over me unless God gives it to you. <laughs> Jesus said that right in the face of the governor of Judea. And he said, not only that, if I be lifted up from the earth, if I am crucified, he said he spoke, th said he spoke this about the death he should die. If I be lifted up, from the earth. They nailed him to the cross, laid him down, nailed him to the cross with rugged nails. And then they picked up that cross and dropped it in the hole, and his own weight was upon him. He did that for us. He said, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Check this out if you're up for it. You up for it today? What time is it? Oh, my hour is gone. What, what? Time flies when you're having fun. Or like the frog said, time's fun when you're having flies. <laughs> Revelation 12 said, in verse 7, 
And there was war in heaven. We're fast forwarding now to a place right in the middle of the great tribulation. Right in the middle of a seven year period of tribulation that God has prophesied of. And said that it, this is the very thing that precedes the coming of the Lord when he shall bring the nations in subjection. Right in the middle of that tribulation week of seven years. He said there's war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. See, when Satan staged that rebellion, Lucifer, and he was cast out of heaven, there were angels that went with him. He deceived them. And those fallen angels are what you call today devils, deceivers. And this is in the tribulation, and the angels will fight alongside Satan the dragon. He said, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. See there? Satan, prince of the power of the air, place in heaven. He said, there is no more place for him in the heavens. This is the removal of the prince of the power of the air. This is Jesus stepping out on the basis of the cross and the power that he gained there on the cross, taking back the dominion over the world. Well, we know, H.G. Wells, that uh, the aliens did not take over the world. And Satan thought that he rules the world, and he really does. He's the God of this world, but he doesn't rule except what God lets him rule. And he doesn't rule you except for the fact that maybe you let him rule you. And so in this war that will come, the great dragon is cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Satan, I want you to hear me now. Think what he said. Satan that deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. I can't wait to see that. That's going to be awesome. And God drops, kicks the devil out across the, the tundra, mile after mile. And his angels were cast out with him, and he said, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our... Man, that feels good right there. For the accuser of our brethren, the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. And he said in Revelation 20, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, <laughs> and a great chain in his hand. So here he comes. He's got a key and a padlock. And it said, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, bound him with the chain, locked him up, and threw him in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. He said, God, and notice what it said, it said a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loose for a little season. God's going to let him out. That shows you God manipulates everything this clown does because he's a defeated foe. He never gained an honest victory in his life. He never did anything but deceive and lie and covet power and have pride. That's all he's ever been, a big loser. And when you get saved, Satan becomes a loser in your life. And Jesus becomes your king. And he takes Satan out and his influence away. He will try to tempt you, but in Christ, you don't have to be tempted and you don't have to give in. Because God gives you the power in the Bible and Romans has said that he made us to reign in life by Christ Jesus. You become the king and the queen of your life. You become the one that says, no, sin will not have dominion over me. Darkness has no power over me. Get thee behind me, Satan. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. 
Why don't you praise him this morning? Come on to the instruments. Hallelujah. There's victory waiting for us. But you that are saved already have it in your life, that personal victory. I want you right here as we get ready to come and pray. Think about the scripture I just threw out there that I grabbed out of 1 John. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Did you understand that? He that is in the world. Open up your eyes. If you're ready to pray, come on. The altar's waiting for you. Open up your eyes, sinner friend. Can't you see all around you that this world is manipulated by something sinister? Can't you tell what's behind all this wickedness around us? Is Jesus your king today? If he's not, then you are manipulated. That's what makes our young people try to fit in at school. Satan wants to manipulate them. And they believe a lie. Clothed in glory. Because he wants them in hell. Majesty he wants them destroyed. Is the Lamb of God. Spread your truth. Now crowned. Let King people know that there really is a way out. With his precious blood. God bless you today. We have pardoned. And stand now, forgiven, he has made us his people to reign eternally. Give him glory, praise.
Praise God. Let's stand and pray today. We're in a new year. Is this the first service of the new year, is it? Be strong. Have hope. Remember, we're not living for all of this. We're living for the wrap-up. No, I'm sorry. Thank you. For the big wrap-up. If you never read the Bible, why don't you read through Revelation? Won't hurt you. When I got saved, it was the first book I read, Revelation. I was just interested in all the creepy end of the world stuff. I had no clue what I was reading, but it was still good. Read it. Read it again. Read the whole Bible. And you'll learn a lot of things and you'll begin to see the big picture. Amen. But this is a new year. We look forward to all the blessings God has for us. And we keep looking beyond. If, you're, if you were in a football game, would you be looking at the goalpost or the players about to tackle you? Probably a good idea to look at both. But don't lose sight of the goal. God bless you. Father, thank you for your word and for the promises in Jesus Christ that are yea and amen. I thank you that you always honor your word and that we have a world to look forward to that's more than just a fairy tale promise, but it's a reality. And I thank you that you don't lie, that you are incapable of lying. Your promises are right and they are good. And God, we give you honor and glory. Thank you for this new year ahead of us. May it be a million times better than 2020. Amen and amen. Somebody's got to say amen to that. Amen. All right. God bless. You. You dismiss. Have a good day. See you tonight.